Hello, my name is Sarah and I'm going to do a short presentation based on some research I carried out in 2019 that has shaped my practice and that of the school I work in regarding positioning of people, in our case pupils, with PMLD. I fully believe, however, that my research findings and subsequent observations are applicable to all people with PMLD. I'm going to keep this brief because I don't have anything for you to look at other than me. What I will be sharing is quite possibly not new or groundbreaking to you, but I hope you find it interesting nonetheless, and I hope it adds to your enthusiasm for doing the very best we can for our special PMLD friends. I apologise, I am reading notes, but I want to be able to do this in one take. So a quick introduction to me and how I've ended up here doing this. I've worked in the same special needs primary school in Hampshire since 2003. I've worked with children with a variety of needs and spent nine years based solely in a PMLD classroom. During that time, I gained a keen interest in the therapy aspect of the job and my role eventually changed from classroom assistant to therapy assistant, which meant I had a part to play in how therapy and education work together, or were at least meant to. In 2018, I took on study at the University of Birmingham for a master's degree in special education, specifically PMLD, and my job role as therapy assistant informed the piece of research that this presentation is based on. The idea for my research project came from a chance conversation with a friend who is also a PMLD practitioner. We were talking about how sometimes the children we worked with were more engaged in activities than others and, than others, and wondered why that might be. When there is an activity we know someone with PMLD enjoys, will they enjoy it and engage with it every time? So let's think about ourselves for a minute. We are able, generally, to control our levels of arousal and engagement and can choose what we do, when we do it and how we do it. We get into a relaxed and comfortable position if we want to read a book or drink a cup of tea or watch a film. We go for a walk in order to stimulate our senses or burn off excess energy. We do harder exercise to increase our fitness. We may snuggle up with a loved one for connection and companionship. Some of us do yoga or pilates to keep supple as we get older. We think carefully about how we sleep and what we sleep on. We get to choose what we do and when and for how long. We have control over our level of engagement depending on what we're doing. I, for one, don't watch TV standing up. I don't take a textbook to the bath, I take a good novel. If I want to read a research paper or need to produce a piece of work, I'll sit at a desk and I'll limit the distractions around me. I don't drink a cup of tea sat bolt upright with my legs put out in front of me in a fixed position. I didn't write any of my assignments in a yoga position. Physically and practically, that goes without saying, but think about it cognitively. How could I concentrate when trying to keep my balance at the same time? These things mustn't just coexist, they've got to synthesise in order to be effective. It's a combination of an interaction between the position and the activity. That's all putting into context where we, where we may be at, but for our PMLD friends it's clearly not that straightforward. The introduction to my research focused on just how important a 24-hour approach to postural care is for some, probably most, people with PMLD. Their postural management from their head to their toes is crucial for maintaining their health and quality of life. We know that physio programmes, positioning and equipment are beneficial and necessary. We know that providing a responsive and stimulating environment is beneficial and necessary. We know that comfort and connecting with others is beneficial and necessary. How can we make all of this work together? How can we incorporate this into the everyday for them and maximise their opportunities to access all the things that life has for them and in the case of my research, an education that they have a right to? One of the best things about doing research for my master's degree was properly looking at things that we see, if that makes sense. 
we see things all the time, but when we concentrate on properly looking at what we're seeing, we'll see and learn even more. So I'll now talk through what I saw. So the young lady I focused on was nine when I carried out the research and her parents were very supportive of the whole process. I spoke with her mum and I asked her what her daughter looked like and behaved like when she wasn't in school, when she was at her absolute best top A star level of engagement, but also what she looked like when completely disengaged. And then I asked her to describe everything else in between. Myself and the team that I work with in class could answer the same questions for when she was in school. And I also spoke with her physios, one of whom had worked with her since she was a baby. And she had fantastic insight into how my young friend's body language indicated her level of engagement in physio activities. I put all of the information together and was able to come up with a four point scale measuring top engagement down to complete disengagement. And the class team were all on board with how to observe, measure and record levels of engagement for our friend at various points throughout the school day. And we did this over the course of a couple of weeks. We were able to observe her in various positions doing a variety of activities. The results showed conclusively that for this particular young lady, her positioning and postural management was hugely influential on her ability to and willingness to engage with whatever was happening around her. The positions and equipment we focused on, there were five, were her standing frame, her class seating, bench sitting, long sitting and lying on a beanbag. I think the easiest way for me to do this is to go through each piece of equipment or position um, and explain what we observed. So we did at least seven observations for each piece of equipment with three different activities potentially happening um, over those seven observations. And this was done over a two week period. All five positions uh, provided a really interesting set of results. So I'll start with the beanbag. So it's an enormous beanbag that this young lady um, used to lie on for periods of time. And it was designed for comfort and relaxation through reduction in muscle tone. When on the beanbag, our friend showed two different states, both at the top end of engagement. She showed periods of engagement, uh, which was the second um, down on the scale. Um, and she showed this level when doing independent learning activities, which would have been exploring objects and toys independently. But she never reached the maximum level of engagement doing this. We wondered, was she perhaps too relaxed to reach that top level? The second state that she reached on the beanbag that was recorded was maximum engagement. And this happened when the activity involved a member of staff being really quite close to her, sharing her space and doing something like intensive interaction or singing with her. The physical closeness of, a, of an adult alerted her to reach maximum engagement. When in equipment, it's harder for an adult to perhaps get close enough to have that same effect. The next position was long sitting. This would have taken place um, on an achiever bed. I hope that term's familiar to, to most of you. A bed, um, and she would have been sat upright with her legs straight out in front of her, possibly wearing leg gaiters and would have been for um, stretching her hamstrings. In this position, maximum engagement on the scale was never achieved with any of the activities. There were periods of engagement, but they weren't sustained. Potentially her disapproval of this position or the effort it took to concentrate on something when she wasn't feeling particularly comfortable, perhaps because of the stretch, meant that this was not a good position for her to engage in a learning activity. The next position is her class seating. Now this is a chair designed to be comfortable and supportive. This piece of equipment yielded the most varied set of results. 
there were periods of maximum engagement. So we knew that this could be achieved in this position, but it wasn't always reached. We wondered why. Was it perhaps that the chair was so comfortable and supportive that our friend didn't really have to switch on physically? And did this then have a knock-on effect, meaning that she didn't really switch on cognitively either? The results from the remaining two pieces of equipment were really interesting. So in her stander, on all seven occasions, the observation was recorded at the second highest level of engagement on the scale. She consistently showed periods of engagement but never reached that maximum level of engagement. We interpreted this as being an indication that she was alerted to learn when in her standing frame, but that the physical demands of being in that position meant that she had other things on her mind that distracted her from being able to be fully engaged. Lastly, bench sitting. This involved uh, sitting on a therapy bench with sort of support at her hips, at her hips and her back. Um, just guides ra rather than any support. In this position, our friend hit maximum engagement on every single occasion, no matter what the activity was. This surprised us as there was a lot asked of her in this position, as it offered such, you know, very little support. She had to work really hard to hold up her trunk and her head. But it was this hard work, however, that seemed to alert her physically and cognitively to maximum levels of engagement. Crucially, though it was hard work, there wouldn't have been any stretching of muscles or any other discomfort when in this position. So that wouldn't have been as distracting as potentially the long sitting or the standing. Also, there was always a lot of praise from the adults supporting her when she was bench sitting. So self-esteem and, and a sort of her sense of achievement may also have been a factor. So in very brief conclusion, the beanbag was comfortable and allowed for closeness. Possibly too comfortable to learn something new, but certainly good really good for working on interaction skills and just chilling out and being with someone. Long sitting was too uncomfortable to engage with meaningful learning. That position may have needed something very distracting to go alongside it, maybe TV or chill out time, but it really wasn't good for her for learning. The class chair was too comfortable and supportive to maintain that real top level of engagement that would be conducive with learning. So maybe familiar activities were better for her in that position or and consolidating skills would have been appropriate here. Maybe creative activities, but learning something new was possibly not, that possibly wasn't the right piece of equipment for that. The stander, potentially again, not ideal for something new, but familiar routines, distracting activities may work well. Routine and familiarity can soften the blow and distract from something uncomfortable. Bench sitting, this was absolutely the best position for her to learn new things. She was very alert, very happy, and she was absolutely ready for action. So this is how we applied the information that we garnered from looking closely at what our friend demonstrated to us. We looked at all the other children's positioning too after we'd done this research and we now do plan things slightly differently. Activities, positions, we match the activity with the position for each child depending on what we know their level of engagement is likely to be. Like I implied earlier, therapy and education or therapy and leisure or therapy and routine shouldn't merely coexist, they should be inseparable. And they can be if we work out exactly how to make it work for each individual according to how they respond physically, cognitively and emotionally to each piece of equipment or position they're in. I really hope you found this interesting. It's been very interesting for me to look back over, over that research. Thank you for your time.